coming. This is the uh, Grab the Mic space on the Beam Exchange. I'm Mike Albu. I'm, I run the Beam Exchange, which is a global platform for knowledge exchange and learning about market systems development. And uh, I'm very pleased to be hosting the four speakers that you see in the slide there. That's Ali Milbrad, Hans Postumus, Rachel Shah, and Adam Kessler, all very experienced uh, practitioners uh, and thinkers in this space. They're going to be talking about a pragmatic approach to assessing system change, a topic which is extremely popular, I'm glad to say. We've got 115 people in the room, we've got several hundred other people who registered for this webinar, so we know that this is going to be a very well, uh, a, a very well received and, and very uh, much in demand uh, topic. Um, as you're here, you, we, we have automatically muted your mic. You can't speak, I'm afraid, there's too many people, but you can ask questions and there, there's a button down the bottom that says Q&A, and please use that to ask questions at any time during the webinar. And we will, after the speakers have, have talked for about half an hour, we will go to a Q&A session for another half an hour. And that's when I will uh, try and pick out the most representative questions and uh, Put them to the speakers. So, um, the other thing I just want to mention is that there is a publication, a, a short ish report, uh, a guide that's associated with this webinar, and it's coming out very soon, I think in the next 48 hours possibly. Um, we will send you a link to that publication as soon as we can after this webinar, along with a recording of the webinar and uh, and uh, the, the slides themselves. So any information that you want to see or the recording, of course, will be very useful if you want to share it with your colleagues. Um, it will all come to you by email, um, probably on Monday morning. That's all I need to do, really. Um, as I said, this is, this is a familiar, hopefully, platform. And if you have any, any questions or issues, use the chat box to talk to Isabel if you've got technical problems or send, if you've got questions for the speakers, use the Q&A button. And um, with that, I'm going to hand over to Adam, Adam Kessler to begin. And I have a question for you, Adam. What is systemic change? Cool. Uh, that's a really interesting question. Thanks for asking. Uh, and I've certainly been in my share of workshops and meetings to discuss it. Uh, and I think what we've learned over the last couple of years is that there is lots of room for debate on what counts or doesn't count as systemic change. Uh, and this can be challenging. But I think we've also learned that you don't need to answer it in order to improve your framework for assessing systemic change. So in this guidance, we really try to focus on assessment. We try to focus on how to improve your, on how to improve your assessment of systemic change rather than giving a global definition. And we try to address the questions that we see programs struggling most with. And these questions include, how can we describe the changes we aim to catalyze as concretely as possible? How can we assess these changes in a practical, implementable way? How can we use this information to improve what we're doing and report clearly to our stakeholders? These are some of the questions that we've tried to address in our guidance. Okay, okay. So, um, Ali, what are the benefits of the approach that you're going to discuss today? So what we're going to discuss today is a back to basics approach to assessing system change. We tested and refined this approach together with practitioners last November at the Advanced Results Measurement Workshop. And it builds on what we're seeing, um, emerging practices we're seeing in mature programs. So it fits with your typical program management cycle. And it helps to structure key steps in that cycle both to better achieve system change and to assess it. So adding to what Adam said, it starts by helping teams to structure their strategies and their plans, to break down the overall system change that they're trying to achieve into a series of concrete measurable changes. And it helps teams to regularly assess system changes, what's happening and what's driving those changes, looking at planned and unexpected changes. And it's really critical to know that staff can carry out these assessments themselves with familiar tools. It helps teams to analyze the information they're getting and to understand what's happening in systems and why, as well as if and how a program has contributed to those changes. 
and the approach provides advice on how to use that information to revise strategies and to report clearly to stakeholders. So in summary, what we're really presenting is a pragmatic way for teams to assess system changes and improve their programs so that they are actually better at achieving system changes that benefit their target groups at scale. Okay, okay. So Hans, does that mean that this approach, this guidance is targeted at results measurement specialists? Um, well, Mike, I would rather say also results measurement people. The thing is, like Ellie was explaining a little bit, is if you want to assess system change, you first need to define how you're going to achieve it as a program. What you want to achieve, how you're going to achieve it. So that's a management issue. Equally important is when you have to decide how you want to assess it, how many resources you want to put into it, how the system would look like, that means it's again a management topic. And even more important is if you want to use the information to make to review your strategies, review your intervention plans, it's again a management topic. So to answer your question, Mike, it's actually, as you can imagine, targeting team leaders, senior implementation managers, resource management specialists, as well as donors. You're muted. Right, so it's all of us. So that's good. Um, so Rachel, can you just um, maybe sum up for us what the key elements of the approach are? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so as Ali said, the approach fits into the current management process that a lot of programs use. So I'll just run through that and highlight the key elements as I go. So after programs have done their initial research or diagnosis of systems, the next step is to come up with a system strategy. So as Ali said, this lays out the concrete ways that you want the system to change and how you expect all of the interventions to work together with external factors for that to happen. So as well as being critical for management, this lays the foundation for assessing system change. And then you have aligned intervention plans, which you then implement, and then you get to the assessment part, to monitoring and results measurement. So to assess system change well, we suggest using two lenses. The first says the intervention lens, and this will be pretty familiar to a lot of people on, on the webinar. Um, it's used to assess what effect our activities have and how that follows through to system changes and then impact. Um, looking for ownership, scale, reinforcement from the system. That's something that a lot of programs are already doing, although we provide further guidance. Then there's next the helicopter lens. This is perhaps a little less familiar, and we'll go into more detail as the webinar goes on, but this is a way of assessing the bigger picture what's happening in the main system as a result of all the interventions we're doing and of external factors too, what's happening when you bring it all together. And once you've got data from both of these, you wanna analyze them together because they're complementary, and that then enables you to follow good adaptive management practice, review and revise your system strategy and intervention plans, and then of course, report to stakeholders um, on how systems are changing and also how the program has contributed to it. So the key elements are very embedded in that normal cycle. Okay, so systems are complex, we know that. Um, they're interlinked and they're dynamic. How does, um, how does the program actually do this in practice, Rachel? Yeah, that's really true. And it can seem quite linear when you lay it out the way I just did. And I think the fact that systems are complex is one of the reasons so many programs find dealing with system change challenging and seem kind of overwhelming and hard to grasp. And we tend to deal with this by breaking systems down into parts. That can be really useful, it makes them easier to deal with. But it's also really important to remember that we do need to look at systems as a whole as well, thinking about how those different parts interact, work together and affect each other, which is often in unpredictable ways. So that's the reason for this dual lens. And it all starts with delineating boundaries, being really clear about what do you mean when you say the system. So system boundaries are delineated in any given development program according to the program's goals and objectives. So what's relevant to that, which is found through research and diagnosis. And then of course, what it can realistically achieve with its resources. So to take an example, you might see an opportunity if you're an agricultural program for smallholder farmers to increase their incomes. This is very typical. And in fact, this is based on a real example from the Prisma program in Indonesia, although we've adapted it for the sake of this um, webinar and for learning. But so your goal would be to increase incomes um, by helping farmers to 
find ways to produce better quality and more maize. So if that was the case, then your main system would be the maize system. And you would want to really understand all the different things that affect how smallholder farmers are able to make money off of selling maize. And this might lead you to identify several supporting systems. So if anyone's not familiar with that, that just means systems that can be thought of in their own right as a system, but that also have an effect on how the maize system works for your target group. So let's say in this case, we identified post-harvest equipment, irrigation, hybrid seeds, and information about good agricultural practices or GAP. So then we would draw our boundaries to include these systems and the main maize system. By definition, this means you're excluding a lot of other supporting systems. And they might, almost certainly will, affect the maize system too. But you have to draw boundaries somewhere. And in this case, we've determined that they're not as important, even though they do have an effect. Um, and of course, boundaries may, may change over time as the program learns more, but you do have to draw boundaries somewhere. And then there can be other parts to delineating your boundaries in a complex system as well. So for example, in this case, we're limiting the maize system to maize sold by farmers on Madura Island. So there's a geographical limit there as well. So delineating system boundaries is a really critical foundation for dealing with complex systems and making it manageable. It's important for designing strategy. It's important later for assessing system change because system change is always assessed relative to the boundaries of a system. And then once you've got a clear idea of what you really mean by the system in your program context, then you can come up with a portfolio of interventions to introduce changes to targeted supporting systems and to come up with a wider system strategy for how they might all interact, which of course will have to be reviewed as time goes on. Uh, Mike, I think you're uh, muted again. Apologies. Yeah, I was thinking most programs already, already use, have sort of system strategies. Um, what, what are you proposing to do differently with this approach? Hans, maybe you can answer that. Um, yeah, I can, I think. Well, I should actually, after all this work. Um, it's not so much differently, actually. It's, it's, it's more like adding a little bit to it. Um, and that little bit adding it to it means to make it more easy, more useful to actually use a strategy for your implementation. So most programs, they, they develop a strategy and then what they do is they make a result chain that reflects the interventions they do, how that leads to changes in the system and how that leads to impact. Now, if you then would say, wait a minute, I've done a lot of diagnosis for my initial system, right? So if you describe the starting state on one side and on the other side you have your desired system states, if you put those, those two states in one table, then you see where you are and where you want to be. And that helps you to define how you're going to get there. So what it basically means is just being very clear on what the present state is. So what's the state of the system? And for that, you need a few indicators. You need a few qualitative indicators, a few quantitative indicators. Now, for example, in the same maize case that Rachel was talking about, they said, well, the volume of maize that's being produced and sold from that Madura Island is actually a crucial indicator. So it's a present 395, and we expect that it could go up to 500,000 tons. So that's one indicator, today in future. The other one that might be there is perceptions of the farmers. They perceive it today as a subsistence crop. And Prisma's vision is it's also a cash crop. So you need to define indicators that help you to assess if the system is changing. Do you need many indicators? Uh, no, no, we don't need. You need a few because you want to focus and you want to make it doable. But you do need a few, and the more concrete you make it, the easier it is to actually assess it, but also to use the information to adjust your plans. So you need a few indicators for your main system, and you need a few indicators for each of the supporting systems that you have included in your boundary that Rich was talking about. So in this case, for example, on hybrid Macy, how many companies are actually working towards delivering a system, sorry, delivering a seeds, to the smallholders. It's now one, it should be four in the future. So basically starting state, desired state, and that's it. One more thing is, how are you going to get there? 
So what we need is a plan. And what's in the plan? It basically says what you're going to do, when you're going to do that, and how the changes in one supporting system link to changes in other supporting systems, all the way up to impact. Um, so in this case, for example, Prisma says that it will first focus on hybrid seeds. And once the farmers are actually using them, increasing yields, increasing production, then they say there will be a desire from farmers and a, a willingness to invest into other means like, like irrigation or like uh, post-harvest handling equipment. And that's when Prisma, the program, will then say, okay, then we'll have a market there, a potential market for service providers, and we'll help them. So it's, it's a bit of a sequence, it's a bit of the logic, explaining why and how you're trying to achieve a system change. And the reason for saying that should be as concrete as possible is, is for example, in Sporting System 1, hybrid maize seed. So on the one side, you could say, all right, how many interventions do I need? How many partnerships do I need with seed companies? Do I expect spontaneous trialing in to happen? Well, then you say, I only need one partnership and I expect after one, two, three seasons, X companies to crowd in. Or you say, given the context, I think I need to do a number of partnerships because there won't be spontaneous crowding in. I'm not here today to discuss what should be the right solution. Prisma knows what the right contact is. But the thing is, the message is, if you make it concrete, it helps you to assess at one stage between the starting system, the desired system, and the current system, and is my plan actually working? So basically, that's all we need in terms of a strategy. Okay, great. It, make, it makes it sound very simple. Adam, let, let's talk then about actually assessing systems change. And I've noticed your little icon that's behind uh, Ali's head there, a helicopter and a flashlight. Can you explain what that's all about? Uh, yep, of course. Uh, and I'm going to start off by talking about the flashlight and then I'll hand over to Ali to talk about the helicopter. Um, so with the flashlight, imagine you're mapping a landscape. And one way to do this is to walk across it with a flashlight, uh, looking at specific aspects in detail. And this has real advantages. You can get up close to what you're looking at. You get a really detailed granular picture. It's very concrete. And this is what the flashlight symbolizes. It's about the monitoring that you do through your intervention lens, looking in detail at each intervention to see what's changed. So this is already pretty familiar to a lot of programs. It involves setting out some kind of intervention plan, normally with a results chain, and monitoring change across it. You're really starting with your activities and then moving up to see what changes they make in the system. So this includes a lot of questions familiar to market systems programs like copying, crowding in, adaption, and expansion. In the maze example, for, uh, you might be asking, to what extent does your partner take ownership over the new business model? Why do they do it? What's the scale of the change? What percentage of farmers in your system are buying hybrid seed? What percentage of retailers are selling it? Do other similar businesses adopt a competing business model? Do they take ownership of it? So this often relies on a predefined monitoring plan, but it also needs you to keep your eyes open. You can't necessarily predict what will happen in advance. So if you hear from one of your partners that another business is starting to sell hybrid seed, you'd want to go to that business, ask them questions about what they're doing and why. So you need to stay in close contact with your partners, but also go to talk to actors beyond your partners, making sure you're getting information from as many market actors as possible. Uh, and I will just show a quick um, presentation, to quick slide to demonstrate it. If that's the flashlight, the flashlight is really looking in depth at those kind of specific systems where you're intervening. So now I'll hand over to Ali to talk about the helicopter. So taking off from what Adam said, while a flashlight is going over the landscape, looking at specific things, the helicopter gives you a view of the whole landscape. And the helicopter lens is the same. It's the big picture view, allowing you to identify broad changes and what's driving them. So in this way, it complements the more specific focus of the intervention lens. So we take the maze example again. 
with the helicopter lens, you're going to be assessing how much maize are smallholder farmers selling across the whole system that you've defined. And how is that changing? While the intervention lens looks at specific changes in the maize sold as a result of individual interventions. One thing we've seen in system changes is that they're often caused not by one individual intervention, but by the interaction of multiple interventions. And that change may not even be targeted by one individual intervention. So again, with the maize example, the helicopter lens might find that maize farmers are becoming more commercially oriented, but not because of one individual system change, but because of the combined effects of changes in three or four supporting systems. And this isn't well captured in an, an intervention lens assessment. The helicopter lens is also really useful in assessing changes caused by external factors, things other than the program. So in maize, that might be climate change, improvements in infrastructure, that sort of thing. When we're using the helicopter lens, the starting point is the system strategy. The helicopter lens compares as Han said, how the system works now at the point of assessment with the starting state and the desired state that you outlined in your system strategy. But as Adam said, it's not always predictable. So the challenge is to focus on those expected changes while keeping an eye out for unexpected changes. A simple assessment plan can help you find that right balance. So what you're now seeing on your screen is a format that can help your team translate the sorts of changes that they're looking for into research questions. In maize, you might wanna know if farmers are shifting from subsistence to commercial farming. And there could be two key research questions for that. How do maize farmers perceive maize farming? And are the actual volumes of maize traded increasing across the whole system? The format also helps your staff to think creatively about where, how, and when to get that information. So first of all, you're going to want to get information from a wide representation of farmers, not only those who have interacted with your program partners. It could also be useful to talk to traders, and to district agricultural officers. You want to be getting information both on farmers' perceptions about maize farming and then the actual volume of maize traded. So in order to be efficient, you might decide to poll farmers at farmers' markets, ensuring that you talk to farmers who are both selling maize and those who might be there for other reasons, to capture both those who might be becoming more commercial and those who might be staying more on the subsistence. You might also call traders by phone and talk to agricultural officers at an annual event. And the sensible timing for this is at the end of each May season. So what this format really does is to help you think through the information that you need with the helicopter lens and then how to get it. But when it comes to actually getting that information, you can combine it with other information gathering activities, and that makes it much more manageable for staff. Okay. So can you just, this sounds very exciting. Can you just explain, Rachel, why you need both these things, the helicopter and the, the flashlight angle? Yeah, sure. Um, so if you didn't use the intervention lens, then you wouldn't really know what effect your interventions were having. So you might find that the system is changing through the helicopter lens, but you wouldn't really know if you had anything to do with it. When you're introducing changes through interventions, it's really important to trace and track whether those changes are being adopted and whether they're spreading and how the system is responding to them. But on the other hand, if you didn't use a helicopter lens, there'd be a lot that you would miss too. So for example, sometimes in our assessments, we assume that a change in supporting system A, like irrigation, and a change in supporting system B, like access to hybrid seeds, sort of add up to a change in the main system. That's not really how systems work, as we know, those of us who are working with systems in practice. The way changes interact and affect each other can be quite unpredictable. 
and certainly don't necessarily add up in that way. So the helicopter lens explicitly looks at things together, asking what is the joint effect of all these different changes and what is the joint effect on the main system, in maze in this case. So this means it can capture changes that were not predicted, as Ali was saying, or changes that were not targeted by any one in intervention, as she was also saying, and then also changes that are caused by things that have nothing to do with the program, which is really important to monitor and really important for later building a contribution story. So if, for example, in this case, you didn't have any intervention specifically targeting informal norms, but you wanted informal norms to change, but you still need to monitor whether they are changing it, but it wouldn't show up in any of your intervention plans or results chains. Nonetheless, you need to assess it, and the helicopter lens gives you a way to do it. So there is overlap between them, and that's, that's deliberate, and that's important, but the real strength comes in using them both together. By combining findings from both lenses, a program can form a credible picture of whether and how the systems that they're working with are changing at all, and then whether and how the program has contributed to those changes. Okay. So that's it, you're done? Uh, so not quite. Okay. <laughs> um, as always in monitoring, the important question is not so much what you collect, but how you use it. So a critical step is to use the information that you're collecting on system changes to go back and revise the plans. Uh, and we saw this in the slide that, um, that Rachel showed earlier, uh, where the process flow. Once you get to your analysis of system changes, you also Oh, it's misclicking. Yep. You also want to review and revise, go back and develop your system strategy and intervention plans. So most programs review their intervention plans every three to six months. And when they do this, they should consider data gathered through the intervention lens. They should look at why, how, how many targeted system actors change their behavior, their degree of ownership over changes, their ability to respond to future changes. For example, if a new maze business model is starting to be more widely adopted by stakeholders, it's a promising sign that you can use to decide whether you want to spend more resources promoting it or not. You can also decide to adjust or shut down interventions if there's little likelihood of progress. And most programs review system strategies less frequently, maybe once or twice a year. And when you review your system strategy, you're asking different questions than you ask at the intervention level. It's not about whether activities are successful and you don't have a specific work plan to guide you and assess progress against. It's about whether the pieces are coming together, whether the sector is changing in the way you envisioned, if it's changing differently and why. And finally, you want to report the changes that you see. Programs are often worried about reporting systems changes because they're not necessarily measured to the same level of robustness as direct changes. But they shouldn't be. System changes are often the most important thing that a program should achieve. So it's important that they report what has happened using the two lenses that we've been talking about. Programs need to describe how they contributed to this change and what other factors have also been important. System changes are never just caused by one thing. So it's important that programs are transparent about the limitations of this analysis, but equally important that it is there in the reporting and programs aren't hiding what they've achieved. Okay. But, but okay, is this only relevant to agricultural programs though? Isn't this, I mean, the case you, you illustrated that. Is this the true, is this the case, Hans? <laughs> well, we were expecting that question actually. Um, no, of course not. Uh, we, we tried it also with S4J in Albania, run by Swiss Contact, which is a vocational education and training program. So basically what they're trying to do is trying to improve the PET system, the VET system, I'll call it. Uh, and basically it means that graduates should be finding employment easier, better employment, and that is not happening at the moment because of lots of problems. And most of the problems is the reputation of that and the performance of that system. So what's the key problem that uh, S4J wants to address? It's basically the training that's being offered by the VET system should be demand driven, should be meeting the needs of the private sector. So on the left, you see the green one. Vocational schools should offer demand driven training. How to get that done? Well, you need to get 
the private sector involved. You need to get the company involved in terms of providing inputs, in terms of providing inputs in what is needed, uh, how can that be given, but also participate. And that means offering partnership, uh, sorry, offering apprenticeships so that graduates, sorry, so that students which are being trained at the premises of the schools are also being an opportunity to practice in real life how does it work? So besides that, that you want the private sector to be part of the vocational training system here, is you want to partner with the schools on a number of other intervention areas and other systems need to change. So the schools, they need to do other things like effective training methods, um, improving market information system. So these are the things that you want to do. Um, so this is the case of S4J in Albania. Um, what does it mean in terms of strategy? Basically the same as in MACE. What's the starting state? What's the desired state? And you need a few indicators to define what it could be. So for the main system, it could be something like average time to employment, which is at the moment nine months, you want it, and you think it might be feasible, to get it down to three months. At the moment, 30% of the graduates are employed in the sector that they were trained for. Well, S4J thinks that they can make changes there, catalyze changes, so that 60% of the graduates will be employed in the sector that they were trained for. Another one is the reputation of that among the companies. It's got a very poor reputation at the moment, and that means that the companies don't recruit graduates because they don't think they meet their needs. As for day things, that could change, and that could be at least like 60% starting to recruit graduates because of that. Um, so again, it's the same as in the May system. You need a starting state, a desired state, a number of indicators to define it, and then you need, again, a plan. What could the plan be? Well, there's lots of plans that they have. Basically, it's showing how they want to move the sector from starting state to desired state. So it explains how they will start with a small number of schools, how they will then try out and make some changes, how they develop some innovations, how they then will spread those innovations among the Fed sector in Albania, and it also talks about how they will influence the national agencies to create flexibility, to give resources to the schools. So there's much more that I could talk about that I don't have the time now, but that's all spreading out, making very operational how they plan to go from starting state to desired state. Uh, just going to the last slides, because I think I see like lots of questions already. Uh, again, it's very similar to the maze case. Um, let's say here that the question is, have school leavers changed their perception of the system? There are two key questions you need to answer. How do school leavers perceive the VET system right now? And are the enrollment rates changing? Same question, who has information about this? Well, let's have a look. There could be school leavers, of course, but also there could be parents. Also, there could be college teachers. They all can give you information, their perceptions, their opinions about the school leavers, how they perceive the VET system. How can you get that information? Maybe not by doing big, big, big surveys. Maybe you need to be sort of a little bit creative. School leavers, many people will say that's social media. That's a very easy tool to get to a lot of people. Uh, parents, they meet at parent meetings at the colleges. Be there when they are there and you can ask a lot of questions to a lot of our parents. Maybe for the college teachers, you have many more indicators that you do want feedback on. So what you could do is set up a panel and do regularly online surveys. Not only for this indicator, but for other indicators that you might have. The same with the enrollment rate. Um, you know that you want it, and it's probably easy to get it from the schools that you are working with initially. But you want the enrollment rates, and also the dropout rates actually, for everybody in Albania. That means you have to think who has information about that. That means that's the national agency. 
that means you need an MOU. Because if you don't get that information from them, you will be having a hard time getting it later. So that means you need to think about all of this on day one. And if you do that, then we think that in any system, not only agriculture, not only in that, but any system, this set of tools might help you to make your strategies more concrete, might help you to think about your assessment in advance and then integrate it into your monitoring system, and then you're done. Okay, thank you, Hans. Uh, one final question I have before we go to uh, the questions that people have put in the, in the Q&A box. Um, I, Ali, I suppose from a practical point of view, this helicopter lens assessment looks like a massive new set of tasks and skills that a programme has to take on board potentially. And does that mean it hiring external consultants and a whole, a whole extra load of work? Well, there is going to be some extra information gathering for those programmes that are not getting any information on the big picture of the systems that they're looking at now. But based on the discussions with practitioners, based on the existing practices we're seeing in programmes, we think it's manageable that staff can actually do these assessments on a regular basis with their internal resources. And a lot of that's about the creativity that Hans was talking about. Not trying to do giant surveys all the time, only when that seems very appropriate, but looking at other ways and looking at how to combine this with existing results measurement that you're doing. And I think there's three key things to remember that make it manageable. The first is in the strategy, to break those system changes down into measurable changes with those clear quantitative and qualitative indicators we've been talking about. The next is really emphasizing what Hunt said, plan the helicopter lens assessment in advance. Even if you have to adjust that plan a little bit when you go out to actually gather the information, when you've planned it in advance, that gives your team the opportunity to combine it with other results measurement activities that they're doing. And lastly, it harks back to what Adam was saying. Don't let the issue of, issue of rigor paralyze you. Some information is better than none. Use familiar tools. Only get information when you need it. Because you can always add more rigor in a follow-up assessment if you find something really interesting. And when we think about this whole approach, I think it's important to remember that you don't need to start from scratch. I'm sure a lot of what you've heard today is already familiar. And those new elements you can build onto your existing system incrementally. From what we're hearing, the additional effort is both manageable and well worth the payoff. It helps teams to articulate the system changes that they want to achieve more clearly. It helps teams to plan assessments of system change more efficiently and to gather that information more efficiently. And most importantly, helps teams get a richer understanding of the system change that's happening and why it's happening. And ultimately, that's gonna help teams to change systems more effectively leading to wider and deeper benefits for target groups. Great. Okay, thank you. Well, look, thank you for a very interesting presentation, guys. Uh, there are a lot of questions already, um, and this is how I'm gonna handle it, because we've only got, well, I'm gonna, first of all, I'm gonna ask us all to, let's extend this webinar by 10 minutes longer than originally planned, so we have a full half an hour for all these questions now. So if you don't mind hanging on, until 10 past the hour, that will um, give us enough space to really get into the, the meat of this. Um, what I'm going to try and do is I've, I'm going to try and organise the questions, broadly speaking, into three categories and address them one at a time. So the first category is going to be about this whole issue of um, system strategies and how you plan and create a system strategy at the, in the design of a programme. And then we'll look at questions relating to the actual um, gathering of information, how you do this, how you assess through these two lenses. And then the third category of questions will be the more sort of, uh, the questions about how you actually use that material, how you, how you turn information and data into 
uh, credible uh, conclusions about your program's uh, impact and effect. So let's start with the, like I say, start with the first set of questions, um, strategies and planning for systemic change. There's a question that we received earlier in the registration from Engela Van Klashorst from the Centre for Multicultural Youth. And she asked, um, how do I include system change evaluation indicators in the design of a programme? So maybe, um, Rachel, you could address that question. Yeah, sure. Um, so it's a good question. I would say in terms of integrating it with the design, it's not an add-on, you know, coming up with um, system change indicators is really integral to design. It's actually part of the design process because that's how you're gonna go about thinking about how are things working now? Where is the opportunity for change? Now what's really feasible for the program? So it's very integrated with design. Um, and you're gonna want indicators, talking about system change evaluation indicators, you're gonna want indicators at both helicopter and intervention level. So at the intervention level, remember this is still about system change. So it's indicators about system change in the targeted supporting systems through whatever change you're introducing through the intervention. So a lot of programs are already doing that. As Adam said earlier, that was kind of about adoption, scale, and, and the system response to that. At the helicopter lens, it might be a bit more unfamiliar, and you do want indicators about system change at the helicopter level as well. Um, so these simply explain what you want to change and probably the easiest way to approach it is to answer what you want to change with respect to four simple questions. So those are who is doing what in the system. So those are kind of the, that's the level that we tend to kind of be, be really familiar with and find it quite easy to answer. Um, what do they have access to or what do they use? What are the regulations or informal norms or any other kind of rules? So this is where um, informal norms often come in and that's a really useful indicator of system change. And then what's happening as a result of all of that? So that's the performance of the system. That's what, you know, who, who gets the jobs or what are the maze yields as a result of all the way that those different um, things change, informal norms, who's doing what, what they have access to. So yeah, you want, you want change, system change indicators at both levels and it needs to be really integrated with design. Okay, so Gordon, Rachel, just keeping you on the, on the hot spot, Gordon Freer asks, while you're drawing up the boundaries, um, how do you prioritise and have you thought about a trigger for revising or expanding or changing the boundaries around the system? Yeah, that's a really good question too. So how you prioritise is through your research, through your initial research. So you need to, um, it needs to be evidence-based. Um, so as I said earlier, it's about what's relevant to your program goal. And of course, it, in a way you could say anything's relevant and you could end up going, treating the whole world as one massive system and that would be valid. But we have to be realistic about what's feasible as well. So we draw the boundaries in a way that we're saying what seems most relevant to whatever it is that we want to see change. And then based on, um, based on the research that you've done, hopefully you know what are the most relevant things, what's affecting your main system the most and the specific changes you want to see in your main system, what's affecting that the most. And then you draw the boundaries in terms of how far you expand that in terms of what's feasible with it based on your resources. Um, in terms of triggering revisions to that, that's going to be through that re review and revise process. So it's probably gonna be mainly through the helicopter lens, reviews and revisions. So every sort of six months to a year, taking a look at the system as a whole and saying what's happening, what do we know, what's come up through our monitoring. You know, you're keeping an eye on the things you've excluded, even though you're focusing more on the things you've included. And so you might at that point have a discussion about should we be revising our boundaries? Okay, so maybe this is covering some of the sort of territory, but Chloe Dickinson, um, Sorry, she asked whether how much effort you need to put into predicting, identifying, mitigating, or celebrating unintentional system changes um, based on your interventions. So, I guess this is also about the boundaries to an extent. Well, I, I like this. Yeah. <laughs> I like the celebrating bit, um, depending whether it's a positive or a negative unintended effect, actually. Um, now, I think we have to be clear that if it's unintended, then it's not in your results chain, that's not in your logic, which also means that you can keep an open eye for things that might be happening outside your logic, but not inside. And I think that's a crucial thing. Don't focus too much 
on your results chain only, on your sector logic only, or your system logic. Uh, but keep an open eye. Now that, that's a sort of an open door as well at the same time where people say, yeah, yeah, we keep an open eye. How can you do that? It's, it's by actually saying, all right, make sure you have an attitude within your system that you actually have an open eye. And also that means, for example, include it as a topic in your agenda when you start reviewing your system strategies. Make sure that it's there. Um, I think you will find it out mainly by looking at the helicopter, using the helicopter lens. Because the helicopter lens, like Eddie was explaining, it's basically what's happening in the system. And not thinking about what's happening in the system as a result of my interventions, but what's happening there. And then again, by combining the two lenses, you can maybe find out that there are changes which were not intended, but they are due to your system strategy. Um, I think the key thing is trying to balance between trying to capture everything and trying to forget about a lot of stuff. And I think that's the art of experience. Just try it. Okay. So just to clarify, Hans, because uh, there was a question from Gunn, Ericsson, Skoog about this. You take, when you take the helicopter view, you consider the entire system, not just the, the, the bit of it that you've delimited as your focus. That's a very good question. I think that's the trick that we will have to learn a little bit. In principle, we are focusing on what's within the boundary, right? And we know a lot about it, and we're focusing on that one. When reviewing, when using the helicopter lens, we have to not say there's a wall. We have to say we look over the wall as well, but not all the time. We don't break down the wall and look at the entire system, because like Rich was saying, a little bit exaggerating, then you're looking at the world as one system. Well, that's impossible. So look along, look over the wall once in a while, but don't break down the wall. Okay, thank you. All right, I'm gonna move on to the second category of questions now. So this is really looking at the actual practice of assessing systems change. And there's the obvious question which came uh, in the pre-registration session from Susan Atiang at Abbey Development. And she says, how does one assess system exchange when you know necessarily you have limited skills and resources maybe adam you can help us answer that <laughs> yeah it's it's a really good question um and i think sy systemic or system measurement is like a lot of measurement that you can do it very expensively or you can do it very cheaply and i don't think cheap measurement is necessarily bad measurement it's just that you need to be really aware of the limitations of what you're doing and then transparent in how you report them and there are two points to make and how you make it, how you deal with resource constraints. I think the first one is that you might want to prioritize your measurement. So especially when looking through the intervention lens, you can look at the interventions where you think change is actually likely to be happening at scale, rather than putting the same amount of resources into all of them. Through the, intervent sorry, through the helicopter lens, you do want a wider overview. So you want at least some kind of data coming in from all of your markets, but even here, you can prioritize. If one of your sectors or one of your systems is, is wildly successful, put more of your resources into tracking change in that system. And in terms of methods, you want to look more at exploratory methods rather than big surveys if you're trying to kind of cut resource, uh, deal with resource constraints. So you're trying to play, play a bit of a detective role, tracking down change where you see it. So you might want to rely more heavily on secondary data, quick interviews with market actors, uh, doing more of the work yourself rather, rather than hiring consultants to support you or do it for you. That's, that's my answer, Mike. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm, just, I'm sorry, I'm looking through the questions. I, I tagged one to, to answer to ask you next, but I've, um, I've lost it. So let me just go back to another question, which is um, a practical question. Maybe, Rachel, you can help us address. It's about some of the less tangible things, you know, the social norms and communities, the workplace, perception, bureaucracy. How do you, how do you capture those kind of changes? This is a question from uh, Jani Krishnamurti from India. Yeah, thanks for that. I think it's a really good question because social norms are a really important indicator of system change. Um, and actually there was an, another question in the Q&A about kind of not just looking at superficial things, but looking at the norms that drive those. Um, so it's a good question. Um, and as the question refers to, they can social norms can occur at different scales, 
Um, so in a company or in a country, there's all sorts of different scales you can look at and in different contexts. Um, so mainly that's going to be through the helicopter lens. So there are a few interventions that sort of deliberately target the change of social norms. And that makes sense because actually changing social norms takes a lot of time. It usually takes multiple things working together. Um, it happens in quite unpredictable ways and it often involves, probably always involves external factors as well. So the helicopter lens is a better fit for that. Um, the question asks how, and um, there's lots of different ways of answering that. I think I, I would emphasize the clarity thing again. So we talk often about social norms as like a big bucket, but like what specifically, what social norms are you talking about? What are the norms now? What do you expect to see change and why and among who, which population? So clarity and definition can really help. And then in terms of methods, there's a whole variety of things that you can do. It doesn't have to be really technical. There are um, technical methods, but you can use some pretty simple methods as well. So I would really recommend observation. Um, what people do tells you a lot more about norms than what they say, because norms are often subconscious or semi-conscious. So observing, if for example, you're wanting to look at a norm around gender, observe how people treat men and women, that's really helpful. Um, and then you can also use, of course, interviews to back it up, um, talking to people about their perceptions, their thoughts, their opinions can bring a lot out. There are loads of other methods, but those are probably the most simple ones if you're looking for kind of um, straightforward ways of doing it internally. Okay, okay. Um, I've got a question here, which I think is very interesting. It's from Andre Vording, and I, I hope it, it's, it's directed at you, Hans, and I hope um, you can make sense of it or have the same interpretation as me. But, Andre says, by starting from the actual, by looking at, you know, starting from actual and going to a desired situation, part of your result, part of your impact may be due to you changing or expanding your boundaries. So how do you separate that um, in measurement from systemic impact? Uh, yeah, um, that's a very good question. Uh, and I think we're going to figure out how that could be addressed. What we're foreseeing right now is that if you have a lot, when you do the initial diagnosis of your system, before you define what's within your boundary, you have a lot of information already, right? When you then decide what's in your boundary and what's excluded, you focus then your assessments on what's included. But it doesn't mean that the information you had about what's excluded, that it's lost, you still have it. So if halfway the program you're thinking like, oh, my boundary was too narrow and I need to open it up, then you still have information in your original sector assessment on the systems which were excluded. So I think there's going to be a practical way to figure out how you can use that information. But it does show that what we need to think about is not a very rigid system by saying, these are the indicators on day one, and for 10 years we'll be measuring them, and that's it. I think we need to think about a system where we, every time at the beginning of the program review cycle, say, all right, let's reflect. What do we want to achieve? What's the system like? Are we in the right system? Do we need to change boundaries? And then using the helicopter and lens, intervention lens assessments, do we need to adjust the strategy? And that I think needs to be like a continuous thing throughout the program life. And then I think we can answer, what was it, Andre's question? It will be done. Yeah, it was Andre's question. Okay, I, this, Ali, this, this is sort of related in a way. I had a question from, uh, we had a, a, an earlier question in, in the registration from someone about how you, from Paul and Googie actually, in, in, uh, from Nairobi. He said, and this is very pertinent, how do you measure change in the face of massive shocks or, you know, something like the COVID panic, the COVID pandemic that's happening now? How do you measure change in the face of those kinds of shifts in your whole system thinking? I think that question is high on everybody's priority list right now. Um, mm. And I think what we need to do is to remember that a key role of results measurement is actually to help programs adjust to changing context. And boy, is the context changing right now. Mm. So we need to understand in the systems we're working with, how are they changing? And we need to understand that in a crisis situation. And there's actually quite a lot of literature out there that um, helps us to figure out how to assess markets in crisis. And the, the EMMA toolkit comes to mind. 
And we need to use that information to adapt the program so that it is relevant to the recovery from a crisis and even to building it back better. But obviously, if we're assessing those system changes, we're asking now what's driving those changes now. And we know that right now the overwhelming answer is going to be COVID-19 crisis. So right now, it's going to be a bit difficult to see how our interventions have contributed to different system changes because we've got this, this um, big thing that's driving so many changes right now. But I think in a year or two, what we're going to begin to see is, is being able to assess which of the system changes that a program was promoting have actually stuck despite the crisis or maybe aided by the crisis. And at that time, when we start asking why did they stick or why didn't they stick, we'll start to learn a lot about how we can actually crisis-proof our strategies. How can we actually promote changes in a way that they'll be resilient? Um, and it'll also help us begin to understand not just if the program is contributing to changes, but if the program is contributing to that resilience, which is really critical, you know, not just for a pandemic, but also for big weather events or any other kind of crisis. And all of that's really gonna help us to improve the program. And in terms of reporting, I think we just have to be transparent. At this point in time, we need to say, look, with COVID-19, that's such an overwhelming influence on systems, we can't actually pinpoint our contribution. But as we keep going in the next year or two, we're gonna be really analyzing what has been our contribution to whether changes are sticking or not sticking in a crisis situation. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm, I'm say, I've been saving the best till last, and we've still got uh, like 10 minutes to talk about this, but about a whole host of people have asked kind of the same question, and it's really, it goes to the heart of this, which is how do you, um, how do you ensure that the assumptions, so for this is, this is jo, um, Joss Hosenbosch, for example, he put it in the question in the chat um, earlier here. How does one ensure that the assumptions that project's contribution to systemic change are valid and credible? In other words, as uh, Chris Ringer also put it, what's an intellectually honest and consistent way to report about these findings? And how much systemic change is enough to make statements back to the donor or the funder about um, you know, whether you've achieved systemic change or not, or partial systemic change? You know, what, what, uh, how do you put these two lenses together in a, in a credible and, and rigorous way? Yeah. I'm going to throw that to you, Hans, for first of all, see what you think. Uh, oh, sorry, yeah. <laughs> I think it's a very incredible question, uh, to use the word credible. Um, maybe I'm still a little bit naive, but, but if we're in, in market system development and we want to make it a better world by changing systems, I think we want to learn ourselves what's working and what's not working. So what type of interventions do actually lead to system change? So then not repeating everything we try to promote by using the intervention lens, using the helicopter lens, combining the two lenses and seeing what's really working. Assuming that you do that like honesty is what some people use. Uh, you will find out what has worked and what hasn't worked. What was your role and how big was that role? How significant was your role? Now, I think the trick is that we have a sort of a desire to make it really credible by saying, we, this is a change attributable to us, which I think we should be really considering whether we want to make such statements. Uh, but I think we should be transparent and say, look, this is how we've assessed it. And I, I go back again to my current and my desired state. My, sorry, my starting state, my desired state, and my current state assessment, and then say, these are the facts. This has changed. Present that in, to your stakeholders. This is what we are assessing. This is what we're seeing. Then you can say, these are the facts, and this is how we've interpreted it. And then you explain how you did your contribution analysis. You don't say, we contributed, but you say, this is how we've done it. And this is our conclusion. And I think if you're in your reporting, you're very clear, like, this is a fact, this is our interpretation, and this is what we think we've contributed to, then you're fine. Okay. Okay. Let me, let me push you all collectively a little bit harder on this question then. I suppose um, that 
So as, as, as Marcus put it in his question, um, how do we know that the changes that we're seeing are actually transforming the system and not just shifting some practices within the given structure? Um, and, and I'll put it another way. What would be the red flags, Adam, to identify that an intervention is, is not, if you like, having a systemic change? You can turn it around. Supposing you've got results at an intervention that lens level, but what would tell you that, that that's not actually systemic change? Okay, interesting. I think to up, Susan Ayu from uh, Diffas Australia, by the way. Yeah, no, no, there's several, several very good questions <laughs> in that. So I'm just, uh, I'm just trying to put them together. Um, I might hand over to, to someone else from a panel to, to add afterwards. I think to an extent we have tried to steer away from this question of like, when is something sy systemic change? When is it not systemic change? I think this discussion has been kind of going around for a while, at least for me, I don't find it a helpful kind of framing and and I, I do find that that as a question gets quite distracting. I think what we try to push people to do through this framework is to set out what the system looks like through the kind of intervention and helicopter lens and once you've got that kind of um, system defined to track the changes to it as carefully uh, as carefully as possible. In terms of red flags for like what is not a system change I think from from the program's point of view, like firstly, I think people are sometimes too quick to dismiss change in practice as like um, as as like evidence of system change because I think there's a sense that oh, it needs to be more transformative, it needs to be more kind of deeper. But actually, changes in practice are easily observable, a very good proxy for system change a lot of the time. Alongside that, I think you do need to look at ownership of these changes. Uh, you need to look at why people are changing their practice and whether they intend to continue with it, what the incentives are for them. But I think if you look at those things, you are a long way to seeing whether a change is systemic or not. Uh, and so I guess those are the kind of initial red flags I'll, I'll think about. Does anyone else want to add from the panel? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> you add. <laughs> well, reacting on both, on, on what you were saying, Adam, and what Mar Marcus was asking, I think, if you think in your design, uh, not so much what will be the red flags popping up, but in your design, you have to think about which changes do I want to achieve and how do I achieve that? Which means that you think not so much who's the best partner to achieve more impact right now, but who's the best partner and what type of information can I do now so that I create crowding in or a response. Uh, so I think it's including that in your design stage rather than to say, what's working at the end and what's not, and how do I find out? That helps. The other thing is, um, the example we gave from Prisma is basically by changing the system and responding to Marcus' question, but is that not just reinforcing or is it not just not making a real change? I think if you say, if you define, that's when we started initially, define what the change is that you're looking for as a program, as a donor. And we are not saying that should be this type of change or that type of change. It should be a transaction, a transition of the sector or not. Whatever it is that you define as a change, I think those tools that we've now applied to two cases, MACE and TVET, our, our aim is to help the, the field with those tools and then apply to any system change framework that, that you'd like. Yeah, just adding to what Hans said and, and taking an example, going back to Maze, by making that system change really concrete that you're trying to achieve. So, for example, you might say, we want big companies to take smallholder farmers in Madura seriously as customers and as suppliers. So that sort of a change is obviously going to be the result of lots of different, different factors coming in. It's not going to be just one thing that's going to make companies start to take smallholder farmers you know, more seriously as customers and suppliers. But we've defined that change clearly. And we've thought about, okay, well, what are gonna be the indicators to know if that change is happening or not? And then we can start to look at, well, if we start to see that companies are starting to transact or at least are showing signs of being interested in smallholder farmers, well, why is that happening? 
And that why is a question we answer all the time in our diagnostic assessments. What's driving those changes? And then we can see, okay, there's, there's lots of different things driving those changes. Here they are, one, two, three, four, five. And of those, our interventions are addressing a couple of those reasons. And it begins to give you a sense of where we're contributing to those big picture changes and what other things are also contributing to those big picture changes. Okay. Can I, I want to pick up on a question that Tamam asked. Um, because, sorry, Tamam, I don't know if you're, if you're a man or a woman, but Tamam, Tamam said, is there a way to measure how systems' inherent qualities are changing? so that the system is more capable of managing new problems, for example. And I'm, I'm very interested in that kind of dynamic. Hans, you said it's a question of deciding what your, what your goal, what your strategy aims are. So maybe let's assume that you've made that your, one of your system, your strategic kind of ambitions is, is the system's more capable of, of coping with shocks, more capable of managing new information, new problems. How could, how, are there ways to um, assess that kind, those kind of things? more inherent and intangible qualities? Yeah, I think it's, it's a very good question and very difficult to answer in just two minutes. Um, but it's, it's again unpacking that word has been used before, right? So what does the sector or the system need now? What, how does the system look like right now? And how should it be in order to be resilient, in order to be able to address new problems, in order to resist shocks? So. To talk in general about how that should be, what the indicator should be, is very difficult. But once you have done the diagnosis, you see what's missing. You see that there's a bunch of actors doing things, but maybe there's some kind of organization missing that is able to support those companies later. So talking about shocks, talking about resilience, I think you have to, your analysis will show what is missing in the sect, in the system. And then you think, how can the sector develop itself in such a way that they can resist shocks or can address problems together jointly. So you are probably going more into what we often call business enabling environment type of interventions. Um, so those are the things you need to look at. And the problem is a little bit, it's, it's too difficult to talk in, in general about what good resilience indicators are and what good strategies are. But I think it's a very interesting question. And, once you do the analysis, you will probably find out what they are in your case. I do agree that we need to move on from a bunch of interventions towards a more defined strategy to address resilience in many systems. Can I jump in and add something? Please, please do, Rachel. We've got one minute left. Okay, I'll be quick. I think even, I think if you look, look back in history, you know, system changes happen iteratively and slowly. So, but even when the program is live, you can see dynamism in action. You can see adaptation. You can see how people respond to changes. And you want to look for those kind of, you want to look for that kind of dynamism. That's an indicator. And you also want to look for independence. You know, where is change happening independently of any kind of prop ups from the program or from um, other, other external players like other programs? Um, and then I think you would also be looking for feedback loops or um, reinforcement or response, whatever you want to call it, which is, again, that iterative process of, okay, we're not saying, like, this, this is a somewhat arbitrary distinction between practices and norms in anthropology, which is my academic background. Those things are very closely tied together. And so you want to be looking for, well, what do people do? And then how do people think about what they do? And then what do they do? And how, and that happens iteratively over time. And if you can look for those feedback loops between different people's practices, and also the way that different people think about those practices, then you're gonna have a, you know, a pretty strong and credible indicator that things are changing if you've got those three things. So independence, feedback loops, and dynamism, they are all overlap with each other, but those, those make for a strong story. Right. Okay. I'm, I'm afraid we've run out of time, guys. It's been a really fascinating conversation. Uh, 